Welcome, and thank you, everyone, for standing by. Now, guests on the telephones are in a listen-only mode until the question and answer sessions of today's event. At those times, you may press star 1 on your touchtone phone if you would like to ask a question. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, of course, you may disconnect. And now I would like to turn the conference over to Erling Dowell. Thank you, ma'am. You may begin. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our November LED webinar the last webinar of 2021. On behalf of the U.S. Census Bureau and the Local Employment Dynamics Partnership, in collaboration with the Council for Community and Economic Research and the Labor Market Information Institute, it is my pleasure to welcome another esteemed speaker from the 2021 LED Partnership Virtual Workshop, Leah Brooks, as she presents three graphs and two maps about jobs and telework during the coronavirus. How can you use neighborhood-level employment data to make educated guesses about the return from COVID hibernation? Brooks uses LEHD Origin Destination Employment Statistics, or LOADS data, combined with the other census products to look at neighborhood-level telework potential and its relationship with income and population density. Leah Brooks is an associate professor in the Trachtenberg School of Public Policy and the Public Administration at George Washington University and Director of the University Center for Washington Area Studies. After Brooks received her PhD from the University of California, Los Angeles, she taught at the University of Toronto and McGill University and worked at the Federal Reserve Board for Governors. Her work to date includes examination of business improvement districts and land assembly, an analysis of the Community Development Block Grant Program an investigation of the long-term impacts of streetcar investments in Los Angeles on urban form, and an analysis of whether and why U.S. infrastructure costs have increased. She is currently working on understanding the long-term impacts of Washington, D.C.'s 1968 civil disturbance and the impact of e-commerce on how retail establishment cluster. She serves on the editorial board of the Journal of Urban Economics, and the National Tax Journal. With that, I welcome Leah Brooks. Thank you, Arlene, for having me. And before I get started, I want to turn on my camera so you can see me. And I also want to say thank you to the census for all these great data products. So, Arlene, you want me to just go ahead? I'm going to take that as a yes, please. All right, please. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So um, first, thanks again for the uh, the census for inviting me, and particularly for having these marvelous data products that I've used in tons of research. So I'm talking today um, about two projects, both of which are using loads data to help me understand how cities may evolve with telework. But before I get started, I just want to say that I did the first project under the auspices of the Center for Washington Area Studies at George Washington. And the mission of this center is to improve the lives of people in greater Washington, the greater Washington area by studying the neighborhoods and communities of our region. We produce policy-relevant research on the capital region, and we host events for the public on topical issues. And my goal today in this presentation is to talk for about 20 minutes to show you our graph um, for two different um, topics, and then explain at the very end a bit how we made them. So I'm going to do more on the results and less on the process, but I'm very happy to talk about the process if you would like to ask questions in the Q&A. And the, also before I get started, I'm going to give you a few definitions about what the Washington area is um, for purposes of our center. So we have divided the Washington area into urban suburban, and exurban areas. So the urban areas are those in dark blue. That's the city of Washington, D.C., and the two pieces that used to be part of the original city of Washington, D.C., Arlington County and the city of Alexandria. Then in light blue, what we've called the suburban jurisdictions, Montgomery County, Fairfax County, and Prince George's County. And then beyond that, in green, we have the exurban jurisdictions. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is based on work from two projects. The first one is a project I did in the immediate aftermath of uh, the COVID shutdowns in March. 
uh, about the D.C. area. And this was for an annual report that I make for my center. And in that report, we try to give a pulse of the Washington area on some important uh, economic or demographic topic. And when we were putting together the report, it became clear that, you know, when we started writing the report in fall of 2018, it didn't seem like Sorry, fall of 2019, it didn't seem like we were going to have to say anything about COVID. But by the time we were about to publish it in March, it seemed clear we had to say something. So I'm going to tell you a bit about the work that we did to directly think about uh, the potential impacts of COVID on the D.C. metro area. And that's joint work with Stan Boyger and Jackie Begley. Stan is at the American Enterprise Institute, and Jackie is at Fannie Mae. And so when we did this in the immediate aftermath, we were trying to understand who can telework in the sense of who has the potential to telework and where do these potential teleworkers live and who is most likely to be immediately harmed by the shutdown. So this first pass was a very immediate, quick <clears throat> attempt to understand what we thought COVID might do in the short run to the DC metro area. And it helped us think about some bigger questions which we looked at over the following year about what this might mean for the U.S. as a whole. And this second piece is a joint project, again, with Stan Boyger and also with Bill Hoxie, who's now a Ph.D. student at UCSD. And here we're trying to look out a little bit longer and ask what, is, what will COVID-induced telework mean for cities and where were workers with telework potential living pre-COVID as a way to help us understand what COVID-induced telework might mean for cities. So let me start with the first one. What is, how did we think about COVID's effects right away? So in the immediate aftermath of shutdowns, what could census data help us understand about COVID's potential impact? So first, now I want to be up front. These next three graphs are not actually from loads data. They're from uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics data that shows us um, regional for the D.C. region, the number of employees in different, uh, number of jobs in different um, industries. So what you can see in this picture is that the D.C. area is very, very, very heavily tilted towards professional, scientific, and technical services. More than one in eight workers in the D.C. area is in this sort of white-collar business services kind of Field. And this is actually, I'm not showing you other metro areas, but D.C. is unique in having this concentration of jobs in this particular industry. But you also see that more than one in ten jobs are in healthcare and social assistance, um, about one in ten jobs are in educational services, and you can see that basically no one in the greater Washington area works in the mining or gas industry or in the agricultural industry, as you might expect. Furthermore, um, we can see that a lot of regional jobs can be done from home. So we're going to use this measure throughout. This is a measure developed by two economists. It's a measure of a job's potential to telework based on features of that particular occupation um, and then aggregated up to an industry level. So we took these economists' estimates of telework ability or telework potential by industry and added them in to the, to the uh, data that we got here from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and later to the load data from the census. So I want to be up front and tell you these are not the actual teleworking amounts or teleworking shares that we have seen during COVID. This is an estimate of teleworkability done at the very beginning of the pandemic from the, the features of an occupation. So what you can see is and here I'm reporting, I should say, in the bar, the share of jobs in that industry that are unable to telework. So in D.C.'s largest industry, professional, scientific, and technical services, you can see that most workers actually can telework. About one in five, if you look at that first purple bar, cannot telework. However, workers in healthcare and social assistance, at least by this measure, three-quarters of them were unable to telework. Now, I think you know, you can see that these data are somewhat limited because teachers did telework last year. Um, maybe not always super successfully, but they indeed did telework. Um, and you can see that 
uh, in these two first bars. All right, so putting these two graphs together, you can see that telework is difficult in some of the region's largest industries. So not in professional scientific and technical services where telework is reasonably easy, but in healthcare and social assistance, telework is difficult. In accommodation and food services, which accounts for just under 10% or accounted for under 10% of regional jobs, telework is difficult. You can see that in accommodation and food services, almost all jobs were estimated to be unable to telework. Same for retail trade, which also accounts for a large number of local jobs. So that's point one. You could even see, so I would say, you know, even in March, at the beginning of the pandemic, you could, you could see where the pain of the shutdown was going to be located. The second thing we wanted to notice is that we wanted to point out is that the ability to telework was higher in higher income neighborhoods. So each of the dots in this figure is a census block group. A census block group is a neighborhood of between six and 3,000 people, roughly. Um, and these are showing census block groups in the greater Washington metropolitan area. And we're using the census block group median income from the American Community Survey. That's what we're plotting on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we're plotting the share of jobs that cannot telework. And so I think the first important thing to take away from this graph is that the higher the income, as you move to the right on the x-axis, the lower the share of jobs that cannot telework, or perhaps better understood, the more jobs that can telework. And the lower the income, the farther to the left on the x-axis, the greater the share of jobs that cannot telework. Now, you may notice that the dots in this picture are colored. And what I'm going to do is color them I'm going to draw the best fit line here for those dots by the three regional definitions I mentioned earlier, exurban in green, suburban in middle blue, and urban in dark blue. And what you can see here is that for any given income, so if you look for incomes for neighborhoods with incomes, a median income of 100,000, the urban areas have more jobs with potential to telework than suburban or ex-urban neighborhoods. And this actually struck us as, as surprising because you might think that if you have the ability to telework, you would live farther away in these ex-urban areas and take advantage of that ability to telework um, and pay less for your house or get a larger house, pay the same amount of money and get a larger house. Um, but that's not what we see systematically at any of these income levels. For any income level, we see urban residents having jobs that are more teleworkable than suburban or exurban uh, neighborhoods. Now, I think a fair a fair thing to think about here is that this is all this is all sort of based on data pre-pandemic. So, while workers may have had the ability to telework, that's not the same as actually teleworking. Um, so, for example, my husband has had the functional ability to telework for a long time, but never actually has done any telework until after the pandemic. So this may also reflect norms at work rather than the ability to telework, but I'm happy to talk about that in greater detail. And then we wanted to take a look at where workers who cannot telework live. So I think at the beginning of the pandemic, we were most concerned about neighborhoods with a lot of renters, and this graph on the left is showing you the share of renters by block group in the greater Washington area. Um, and the red is the, uh, the red are the metro lines, if you can see them there. And you can see that uh, the renters are concentrated, not exclusively, but frequently near these metro lines and also near major freeways, which I'm not showing in this picture. Um, the darker the share, the higher the, the darker the color, the greater the share of renters. And this graph shows you the same neighborhoods, but here, instead of the share of renters, we're showing you the share of non the share of jobs that do not have the potential to telework. And you can see, sort of consistent with what you saw in the previous graph, that these non-teleworkable jobs are much more concentrated in the exurban areas, for the most part, than in the urban areas. And that there are some urban areas 
that have a very, very high uh, value of non-teleworkable uh, teleworkable jobs. That's the very light purple near the center of the city. So at the beginning of the pandemic, we were concerned about, I think this was before um, the bans on eviction came into place, but concerned about neighborhoods with renters where people had jobs that they were going to lose because they simply couldn't telework. And you can see that there is some overlap here between the share, high shares of non-teleworkable jobs and high shares of renters, but that these aren't necessarily always the same neighborhoods. So that's where we left off things in the spring, sort of with this uh, ominous view about the future. And this led us to thinking sort of bigger picture about COVID's potential impact in the long run. We had done we had done this work for Washington, but what we found did what we found for Washington hold for the U.S. as a whole, and how could we think about what the impact of COVID might be in the long run for cities? So, in this second project, we wanted to think what what does a switch to remote work mean for cities? And I think everyone would agree that COVID has deeply accelerated the shift to remote work. And the real question here is whether this is a blip or permanent change. And that's, I think this is a question that we simply just do not know the answer to yet, but it's very important for policymakers in thinking about what kinds of infrastructure we need in cities, in terms of thinking what kind of human capital needs they need to accommodate, in terms of thinking what kind of zoning changes they might want to consider. So, so the answer to this question is fundamentally important for policymakers thinking about cities. Now, we can't look into the future about what the, what will whether this is a blip or a permanent change. But what we can do is look to pre-pandemic behaviors for hints about what this might mean for what increased telework might mean for cities. So what we can do is pre-pandemic ask whether workers in industries with more potential to telework whether those workers are more likely to live in lower density neighborhoods pre-pandemic. So just to repeat that, if you're somebody who has the ability to work from home, whose job has the sort of technical capacity to work from home, um, are you more likely to live in a lower density neighborhood pre-pandemic? And our answer is pretty clearly no. That's just not the case. And we find that workers in potentially teleworkable industries lived in denser places both across and within cities pre-pandemic. I'm going to show you evidence on both of those. But now I want to just take a step back and tell you a little bit more explicitly about where our data come from. And this is both for this project and the previous. So we are using load data, as I think many of you in the audience do as well. Um, we're using the 2017 longitudinal, longitudinal Employer Household Dynamics Origin Destination Employment Statistics. We're using block group level data. and you probably may know that the load data come in three flavors. We're using data by the residential location of worker. So we're using block group data um, that tell us the residential location of workers and the employment characteristics, the industry um, of those workers. And then we combine those data with telework potential by industry. So we're using an industry measure of telework potential from these authors here, from Diggle and Newman. And we're also combining these data with data from the American Community Survey. So median family income by block group. And I think we are also including, I don't have it in the slide, but also population. And we know the area of each census block group, the physical land area. And we put all these things together to get a block group, le block group level measure of the teleworkable share of jobs that also includes neighborhood income. I also want to put in a plug for this project. I grabbed American Community Survey data via Census's new API, which I thought was fantastic. Um, I don't think there's an API for the load data yet, but you can correct me afterwards if I'm wrong, but I did grab the American Community Survey data via API, which was amazing. All right, so we have a block group level data set in this one year that tells us the teleworkable share of jobs and neighborhood income and neighborhood population density. 
And we're using a sample of about 200,000 block groups in metro areas. So in this particular context, we are concerned, we are interested in cities. So we're excluding block groups that are not in census metropolitan areas. All right, so in this first picture, what I'm showing you is the national relationship between block group density and telework potential. So here's, here's what we do to make this picture. Imagine the 200,000 block groups in the United States, line them up by their population density. So from smallest to largest, remember 200,000 block groups in metropolitan areas, and then divide those 200,000 block groups into equally sized um, groups, 100 equally sized groups. And then within each of those 100 equally sized groups, find the average share, um, take, find the average of teleworkability for those block groups. And so there are 100 purple dots in this figure, one for each of those 100 groups. Um, and what I have on the x-axis is the average log, the average population density for those block groups. It's actually a log scale, which is why it goes 112, 148, 1808, um, to make all the block groups visible here. But this is average people per square mile. And I think what's immediately clear from this picture is that the higher, the, the greater the population density of a block group, the more likely people in that block group are to be able to telework. And while we're showing that in this picture, this is not a new finding. People, people were well aware that in higher density places, people had jobs that were more likely to be teleworkable in the sense that they are um, white collar jobs that are information, in, information intensive and can be done with a computer. So this is not a new finding. Um, but what this, what that picture showed us was a national uh, a national comparison. And what you can think of as that picture doing is comparing on the right side of the graph, New York, and on the left side of the graph, cities like Topeka that are much less population dense. So the national figure is really making a comparison across different cities. So it's making a, uh, it has dense cities um, at the far right end and less dense cities at the far left end. We were motivating a very different kind of comparison, a within city comparison. So within a metro area, do workers with more teleworkable jobs live in denser areas? Because that's the question we, uh, we were interested in from our, from our observation of what we saw in the greater Washington area. So to look within cities, we did something slightly different. So now on the x-axis, I'm showing you the percentile of within metro area density. So let me explain how I got there. And if I do a bad job, please feel free to ask me again in the Q&A. All right. So what we did here was we took, imagine now that you make groups of block group, you have a different group of block groups for each metropolitan area. Within each metropolitan area, order your block groups in order. And then again, divide those block groups in order of population density. And again, make 100 groups of those block groups by population density. So assign, and then assign those groups numbers 1 through 100 for their percentile, where 100 is the most dense and 1 is the least dense. And then take an average across all metropolitan areas of the, by this percentile of within metropolitan area density. So now 100 is the densest places in all metropolitan areas, it's not just, it's not, so it's not just places in New York City. Uh, it should be, it's going to be the densest place in New York City, but it'll also be the densest place in Topeka, Kansas, Kansas, and the densest place in Washington, D.C., and the densest place in Dallas, Texas. And zero, similarly, will be the least dense place in New York, I should say one, sorry, one, the least dense place in New York, the least dense place in Topeka, Kansas. Um, and then within those bins of within metropolitan area density, find the average share of jobs that have the potential to telework. I want to give you a heads up. I flipped the, the y-axis here. So now instead of having a negative, we have a positive head. What's the share of jobs that could possibly telework? This is a, this is a repeat of this picture. So here's the, the picture using 
this density measure across the U.S. as a whole. Here's the same picture, but instead of using density across the U.S. as a whole, we're using this measure of density within metropolitan areas. And now you can see the slope is flipped so that within metropolitan areas, in these very densest areas, we see that people are less likely to be able to telework. So instead of a upward slope, we have a downward slope. So what does that mean? How, how do we think about this? Is this density teleworkability relationship really reversed within metros? And we were a little bit suspicious that the, that the answer was quite so simple because it seems inconsistent with evidence we've read about wealthy fleeing dense areas in the immediate COVID aftermath. And we also know the neighborhood income is not evenly distributed by population density. <clears throat> so is this picture we just saw something about income or is it something about density? So to untangle these two, we redid the previous chart, but instead of showing you all income neighborhoods together, like we previously did, now I'm showing you the same chart, but by four income quartiles. So this is the relationship between within metropolitan area population density um, and teleworkability of jobs by income quartile. So for the lowest income quartile, we can see that so these are neighborhoods in the lowest income quartile, block groups in the lowest income quartile, that for those block groups, there's pretty much no relationship between population density and the ability to telework. And I suspect that's because these lowest these lowest income neighborhoods, neighborhoods that are in the lowest income quartile, have residents who have jobs that are very unlikely to be able to telework at all. Um, so density has no, has no impact on their ability to telework. If we look at the neighborhoods in the second quartile of income, so the slightly higher income neighborhoods, we begin to see a modest upward slope. Oops. For neighborhoods in the third quartile of income, now we're starting to see a positive slope. And for the highest income quartile, so these are neighborhoods in the top 25% of income, um, these neighborhoods show a decided positive slope. So you can see that for these neighborhoods, these wealthiest neighborhoods, there is a strong relationship between density and the ability to telework, such that the densest neighborhoods pre-pandemic had people, had jobs with the greatest ability to telework. And that's contrary to this idea of the people who have the ability to telework moving, you know, far out, far from the uh, center of the metro area to, to take advantage of their ability to telework. Now, why that is and whether that may change after COVID, I think, is an open question. But at least pre-COVID, what we see is that these highest income earners, these neighborhoods with the highest income earners, of those neighborhoods, those that were the most dense had the greatest telework potential. So what drives this relationship between the first purple graph, the, the within metro purple graph I showed you with the downward slope, and then these blue dots that basically have an upward slope? How, how do we reconcile those two different graphs? I think the fundamental way to reconcile them is that rich and poor are not evenly distributed across density levels. So I'm going to examine the distribution of each income group across density, uh, across, across neighborhood density levels. So let me show you where neighborhoods where income neighborhoods are located by income within the metro area. So I have the same x-axis, the within metro area population density percentile rank. And I'm showing you the share of neighborhoods that are in this percentile rank that are from the lowest income quartile. So if this lowest income quartile were evenly distributed across all population density ranks, this would be a flat line at 1%. Because you would add up each 1% and that would get us to 100% of neighborhoods. Um, but that's not what we see. What you see is that the neighborhoods in the lowest income quartile are very overrepresented at the 
high end of the population density distribution and under mostly underrepresented at the low end. This is the second lowest income quartile and neighborhoods in the second lowest income quartile. And here you see these, these guys are actually pretty evenly distributed across within metro area density. And then for the two top income categories, what you see is that highest, the highest income neighborhoods are overrepresented at lower relative densities at the bottom of the graph and underrepresented over here at the top of the graph. So what I take from this is that we saw in the previous picture, we saw this relationship between within metro population density and the ability to telework um, for neighborhoods in the top income quartile. That relationship seems to be driven almost exclusively by a very small number, it's very small, it's probably too strong, a somewhat small number of these very high income neighborhoods that are in very dense places in the metro area. So what might drive this difference in the density income relationship between the uh, cross metro and within metro uh, behavior? First, it might be that people in higher income neighborhoods are more willing to pay for the things that are offered in dense areas. Theater, fancy foods, fancy shops, things that would make you live in a dense area even, in the, even when you are able to telework. But it might be that people in higher income neighborhoods value the benefit they derive from living in an area with dense employment. And that includes maybe the spillovers that come uh, by running into neighbors in industries like your own or neighborhood neighbors that can um, help you in your career or help you find jobs or uh, help your kid get into a better school, any of those things. Or both of these could be true together. So in this next, our next step in this project is to try and understand what is driving um, this relationship between density and income within metropolitan areas. And before I wrap up, just a few quick words about how I made these graphs. So these graphs I made in R. I did basically as much as I possibly could, everything in R. I loaded the data. I did the API calls in R. I did the data manipulation in R. I made the maps and graphs in R. I used packages called Tidyverse, particularly the ggplot command for graphics. And for the maps, I used a package called SF, which is a newish package for maps and spatial analysis, about which I cannot say even the most marvelous things are not enough to say about this package. I'm so delighted they have made it. So I'm happy to answer questions about anything, the method, the, the outcome. Thank you all for coming, and thanks again to the census for the marvelous data for which I am so grateful. Okay, well, um while we wait for questions, um, Fran, we're going to be ready for questions at this time. If you would like to ask a question over the telephone, please press star 1 and record your name clearly. Your name is needed to introduce your open line. Again, star 1. And one moment, please. Thank you. So while we wait for the questions to queue up on the phone, I'd like to remind everyone to please be courteous and keep your questions pertaining to the presentation with one follow-up question. We received a few questions regarding the presentation, which will be accessible on the Census Academy website in a week or two at census.gov slash academy under the webinar tab. Also, an evaluation will be mailed to you following this webinar. We would appreciate it if you took the time to fill out this short survey so we may better serve you. And one last thing, my colleague Tonja White will be reading your questions from the chat and then I will close out today's webinar. So, Fran, are there any calls at this time? Thank you. No, none over the telephone. I see there are some questions in the chat. Right. In the so chat, we have, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, Tonja. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no problem. In the chat, we have, but could a job in an, ur an urban an urban area, yet the person doing it could be in exurbia? Yes. Asking yes. just because I exurbia. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> sorry. I realized I cut you off. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. 
asking just because Exerbia com companies don't have telework jobs, are are there not people indeed going there for the bigger houses? Okay, so I, I'm not entirely sure I understand the the full question, and if I if I miss if I don't understand, please follow up. Um, but what the the what's great about the census data is that you can see both where the worker lives and where the job is. So you can. It is true that the worker can be in an urban area and the job can be in an ex-urban area. What we observed and what we did for this project is the residential location of the worker. So we know where the worker lives and we know in what industry that worker is. Um, so the worker could, um, the, the worker certainly could live in an ex-urban area, according to our definition of ex-urban, and have a job in the center of the city. Um, and we would measure that in our data. And that would be an, sort of an exact example of somebody who um, has chosen to live in an ex-urban area and is willing to bear the commute of going into the city for, to, to enjoy what, you know, whatever it is they want in their ex-urban living, whether that's a bigger house or a different kind of schools or a different kind of neighbors or more open space or a more driving-oriented community. Um, but that's absolutely true, and we can see that in the data. Okay, next question. Isn't the telework capability also associated with the availability of high-speed Internet services? I would think that higher density areas have more high-speed Internet access so that there could be problems teleworking from areas that lack sufficient high-speed Internet access services. So I agree this is an excellent point. And so looking forward um, in thinking about where workers might live in the post-COVID era, I think this is a critical point. Um, if you think about these high-tech workers who are decamping from expensive places in the Bay Area or New York and working elsewhere, a key critical component to their ability to work elsewhere is high-speed Internet. And we don't measure that in this project. And, in fact, I don't think there are – there are limited – high quality measures of where high speed internet access is available to the best of my my knowledge. Um, but you know, I if I were a municipal official and I was try in a not large metropolitan area and I was trying to convince people to move to my metropolitan area to take advantage of their ability to tell of your one's ability to telework, I think high the quality of your high speed internet has to be front and center in thinking about whether or not your metropolitan area can host these people. Okay, thank you. The next question has to do with the slide with the income quartiles. Is the income quartiles based on metro, metro areas, income distribution, or national? This is such an excellent question, and I did this a while ago, and I cannot remember. If you want to email me directly, I can actually answer you. I think that I defined it I defined within metro area income quartiles because otherwise you would have uh, because otherwise the income quartiles would be ununiformly distributed across metropolitan areas. But I don't want to swear to it, and I cannot remember. Operator, are there any questions at this time? Thank you. No, I have no questions. Okay, we'll move forward with the questions in the chat line. The next question, are you going to post the slides? I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy to post them on my website. I'm happy also to send them to the census if that's something you guys want to do, whatever seems easier. Yes, they will be posted in a week or two on the censusacademy.gov slash webinars. Thank you. Next question, what role does access to broadband technology play in the lower access to potentially teleworkable employment in less population-dense areas? 
So I think this is uh, the cousin of the previous question. I think it's it's absolutely right that um, that broadband access is central. I mean, essential is probably even too weak a word. Critical um, for attracting workers who want to telework. Uh, I know from anecdotal evidence from a friend who tried to get satellite internet working at a at a house she went to, the satellite internet was not up to the task of sort of regular business functions. I don't know if that's true universally or true just at her house, but it was certainly true just, certainly true at her house. Um, I also suspect that that issue of broadband technology is less salient for the sample that we analyzed, which is block groups in metropolitan areas. Now, I'm not saying that there are not block groups in metropolitan areas that don't have access to broadband, but I think those are not the block groups about which there is the greatest policy concern. I suspect the greatest policy concern is block groups that are outside of metropolitan areas that are um, not that are probably the least well served by broadband and for whom it would be the most expensive to bring broad, broadband. Thank you. Next question is about the availability of load data. The question is exactly, and actually my screen just said something really weird, so just one second, please. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see all it. Us, right? is, are the yes. are the data restricted okay. or publicly available? So yes. I can tell you the data are publicly available. Google census loads. I just downloaded them to my computer. They're they're an amazing resource. Um, so what's I only used a third of these data, which tell you about the residential location of workers and um, what jobs those workers have. Loads also produces a project a product that's very interesting that tells you. Although I don't know. Maybe the census people can speak to this, what you guys are possibly going to do to this product. They produce a second product that tells you about workers by the location of their job. So in the past, I think that was pretty clear, like the location of your job. Not that many teleworkers. Um, my sister is a teleworker, and I don't – maybe this, maybe you at the census can tell me what you do for her. She sits in California and works at a job in Connecticut. Um, so I don't know where you count my sister. She counts in California or she counts in Connecticut. But at any rate, I think this, this product requires a rethink in the era of COVID. But pre-COVID, this was a product that tells you workers by where they work. Um, and then a third product that tells you about where workers commute, basically where for each neighborhood, who, how they, where you are going from and to, which is an amazing product, which I haven't – yet used in my work, um, but I think is fantastic. So those products are all publicly available for many years. You can download them straight from the census website. You need, uh, you know, they can be kind of large, so you need, a, you need enough computing power to be able to open them. But I do all my processing on R, which is free. Um, so they are pretty, they are, they are easily accessible. And I also want to say um, another thanks to Census. I'm working on a new project that using restricted census data at a census research data center um, where I'm trying to understand the impact of e-commerce on physical retail in cities. And those data are not public. But if you are a researcher, um, that is a, an also an amazing, amazing resource for data. Thank you. Operator, are there any questions at this time? Thank you. No, we have no questions over the phone lines. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's a comment. Thank you for the nice presentation. Great figures. Thank you. I want to say thank you because I keep seeing a visualization. When I try to, I'm trying to make the best practices for my students. <laughs> okay, great. And I have another question. Hi, curious about any patterns by region. For example, I'm, I'm out of the south-southwest. I'm wondering if we have different patterns in the West or East. Thanks. That is an excellent question. It's, and the truth is that I do not know, but I'm curious enough from your question that I'm going to actually ask uh, Dan and Phil if we can make – it's actually pretty trivial for us to make that picture by, by region. Um, and I think it will be quite interesting to see if that pattern uh, – if this pattern holds across all regions or if it's 
specific to particular regions. My guess, my guess would be that it would hold in all regions, but I'm, you know, I'm not sure. It's a data question. I don't know the answer. Next question. Can someone from the Census Bureau speak to the when updated loads data may be available, which would allow for updated understanding of where workers are living? I can go ahead and answer that one. Um, loads data actually was just updated last week. Um, 2019 data has come out, and um, hopefully soon we'll have the 2020 data as well. Thank you. Comment. Even rural Alaska has fiber now. Yeah. <laughs> I will say my friend who bought who uh, who has a satellite internet is in semi rural uh, either Maryland or West Virginia with uh, let's say inadequate satellite internet. So I will tell her that rural Alaska is doing better than she is. All right. Okay. Next question. Great presentation and great research. Thank you. Question. When estimating teleworkability, I believe you just used the industry two-digit mix, yes? Did you consider income or demographic characteristics, or have you considered incorporating these? Lowe said it has some limited categorical data on, on, excuse me, on employment, income, and we from BLS and others, and probably into others into it. Intu I can't speak today, intuitively, that higher income jobs tend to have higher rates of teleworkability. Likewise, teleworkability disparities by race. Thanks. All right, so let me, let me take these one by one. First, yes, you're 100% right that we use, two, that we use the two-digit NAICS industry for this analysis. Um, and that's more or less the level at which the load data comes. So that was a good link between the dingle Neiman numbers and what's available in the load data. Um, both data also has some limited categorical data on employment. I agree with that. Um, and you can see, and you, you're suggesting that um, there's a relationship between income and teleworkability. And I agree with that. You can see that in our graph. You can see that um, when you looked across neighborhoods of different income quartiles, um, for each successive income quartile, the line was higher, which meant that in higher income neighborhoods, on average, there were more teleworkable jobs. I think the question of telework disparities by race is a really interesting one. Um, and you could do something limited with what we have now, which is that we observe from the American Community Survey, we could observe race, um, and Hispanic origin by neighborhood, and we could look at that um, by teleworkability. Um, I think the more interesting work on this will happen once we have measures of not teleworkability, our sort of pre-COVID measure of teleworkability, but a post-COVID measure of actual telework. I think that's going to be much more informative looking forward because I think um, there are, there are jobs that we may have thought pre-COVID were simply not teleworkable that now seem like they may indeed actually be teleworkable. And I'm sure you're right that there are disparities by race, with, without a doubt. Thank you. Operator, are there any questions at this time? Yes. Yes, we do. Your line is open. You may go ahead and ask your question. Oh, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to tell Leah that I didn't get to hear all of her presentation, but what I heard I was, um, I thought was very excellent. Thank you. You don't always get nice calls. <laughs> Thank you. I have no further, further are there any other questions? Okay, Thank you. The next question um, is, is the presenter, does the presenter have a website link? I, I know at the census we will post the web recording in one to two weeks along the transcript, but do you, do you have a website link? Yeah, you can find me at Leah Brooks, L-E-A-H-B-R-O-O-K-S dot org, O-R-G. I don't think I have a, I do not yet have a draft of this second paper up, but if you're interested, I can, I can send it to you if you email me.
Next question, what statistic or data point do you wish you had access to to extend this research that, may not, that might not be already, already available at the neighborhood level or otherwise? Okay, well, for a researcher, of course, your dream is that you observe everything about everybody at every single point in time everywhere. Um, I think that's a little bit too much to ask of the census. And it would certainly be, uh-oh, I lost one earbud. Let me go grab it. It would certainly be a violation of privacy. Um, so I think the thing that I would like to know that I don't think is a violation of privacy um, that would be most interesting to try and understand uh, how cities might evolve going forward is who is actually teleworking right now and how has that changed over the past year? Um, I think we have some pretty good guesses about which, which jobs have teleworked and which ones haven't. Um, but I think there might be some surprises. Um, for example, are people in suburban office parks, sort of white collar workers in suburban office parks, more likely to be returning to their jobs than white collar workers in downtown um, office buildings? Or for example, are there any geographic differences in where blue collar workers are returning to jobs? Or is that, um, or is that more even across the country because blue collar jobs are more difficult to do via telework. I, those, I think, are really interesting questions um, that require data at a slightly more granular level than you can get from the load data and sort of uh, a little bit more um, nuanced about who is teleworking and when and, and what telework actually means. Thank you. Operator, are there any questions at this time? No, there are none. Next question. Your earlier slides displayed the ability of the industry to telework versus broadband quality, correct? No, I don't have any measures of broadband quality. And in fact, my impression is that there are not great measures of broadband quality. Um, I'm showing in what I showed you in these slides were the ability to telework versus the population density of a neighborhood. Because you might think that people who have the ability to telework, the functional ability in their job to telework, might choose to live in less dense neighborhoods where you might expect that housing would be less expensive. And we don't we don't always see that pattern. I think there was also a question. Um, about where teleworkers were likely to move, if at all. Are they likely to stay locally where their employer is located or move longer distances to different states? I think these data are just coming in. And um, I think it's also, so first, there is some evidence about this. Um, I, had, I cited a paper in the presentation. If you want to email me and follow up about it, there is a nice recent paper about um, where people are moving and how housing prices are, are responding. Um, I think the jury is out on whether those moves are temporary or permanent. Thank you. Is it, is it possible to break all of these out by race and does the census provide CDC hospitalization data? Cool. All right, so first, race. I think the answer is not exactly. So what you can know um, by neighborhood about race is, so let me, let me back up and say, you guys at the census should correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that the load data tell us about race. Please, please correct me if that's wrong. You can put them it together. Does. It does? Yes, we have race um, data in the whack in the rack, in the, um, the first analysis, the overview. Oh, okay. You can also put these, is it, is it race by industry or just race just by location? Just race like by location. Yeah. Just ah, by location. okay. Okay. 
And then I didn't use those data. I, I did put these data together with the American Community Survey data. And there you have a, you know, a great deal more in, information about race, not just um, you know, the share of residents in a neighborhood that are a given race, but race by age, race by, um, race by poverty status, race by income. Um, so a, a lot of additional information about race that you could potentially combine with these loads data um, to say something about disparities. So I, I oh, would like to make sorry. a comment. Um, it's okay. Um, so LEHD, uh, the Longitudinal Employer Household Dynamics Program, actually has a suite of data tools that is based on the worker population. On our QWI, or our Quarterly Workforce Indicators Explorer, you can break down the industries by race and earnings and ethnicity, along with educational attainment, um, and also it goes all the way down to the four-digit NAICS code. Oh, okay, but that is not at the neighborhood level, right? No. It's at the county level. I think it's the smallest level. And uh, the CDC hospitalization data, um, I'll let you guys at the census answer that one. I don't know. We do not have that data. This is a follow-up to the question regarding the ability to um, compare uh, telework versus broadband quality. The follow-up is this would lead to occupational functions within industry and those functions ability to telework. It was, it was a comment in, in response to that question, as a follow-up to that question. Okay. Next question. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, okay. Next question. Is there any steer for someone who might analyze what for some is the big Q? Is this a blip or will it become permanent? Ah, for that you need a crystal ball. Um, no, I. But let me say first, I agree with you. That is a big question. Is this a blip or will it be permanent? Um, I think it's going to determine lots and lots of things um, about how we live our lives in urban areas, and it is just not yet clear. Um, if you're looking for clues, I would look for clues in home values. I would look for clues in, um, this is not a census product, but uh, the, the U.S. Postal Service has information on, on movers that they have a data set about residential mobility and residential vacancies. That's another place you can look for clues. Um, there's, a, there's a number of private companies now that aggregate cell phone data to let you look at where people are physically moving in space, and I think those might give us hints as to where people are physically moving as lockdowns ease and our ability to um, return to somewhat normal approaches. And if we, if we see people returning to urban areas, not just for work but also for recreation, I think that suggests more of a blip. If we see a fundamentally long-term lower level, then I think – this is permanent. It's hard to say. Next, uh, first of all, operator, are there any questions? No, there are not. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Nice presentation. I worked for the D.C. Office of Planning, and I did a similar study for the city. I would like to have it. I would like to have it peer reviewed, and see your your line of work overlaid to mine. How can I reach out to you? If you go to my website, leahbrooks.org, L-E-A-H-B-R-O-O-K-S dot O-R-G, it has all my contact info, my uh, my snail mail, which you shouldn't use, and my email, which you can use. Thank you. Uh, the next question is actually related to one uh, prior. Can you give us your email slowly? Yeah, it's L as in Lion, F as in Frank, Brooks, B R O O K S, at GWU, GWU, dot EDU. Thank you. Operator, are there any further questions at this time? 
No, there are not. Mm -hmm. This concludes the questions in the chat box. Thank you, Tanja, and thank you, Leah. So thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us this afternoon, and thank you to Leah Brooks for her fascinating presentation. I would like to thank um, everyone, especially the LED webinar community, for an overwhelming 2021 LED webinar series. This year, there were more than 3,500 attendees to our live sessions. On behalf of the U.S. Census Bureau and the Local Employment Dynamics Partnership, and the Longitudinal Employer Household Dynamics Program. Happy holidays, and we will see you next year with a new and exciting 2022 LED webinar series. Be healthy and be safe. Conference is now concluded. Again, thank you for your participation. Please go ahead and disconnect.